Good evening. Welcome to the High Museum. I'm Susan Crawley, curator of folk art. We're delighted to have as our guest Dr. Joyce Cohen, who teaches art history at Simmons College in Boston. She teaches a popular course on contemporary art and a course on women in art, which focuses on women as artists from medieval times to the present. Dr. Cohen has had a long time interest in self-taught artists, especially as she says, the women. Most recently, she presented the paper Historians in Aprons about Clementine Hunter and Galen Aiken at the American Folk Art Museum in 2007. Dr. Cohen is also an advisor to the Foundation for American Self-Taught Artists in Philadelphia. Tonight, Dr. Cohen will discuss with us Nellie Mae Rowe's depiction of the theme of house and home, a theme that was actively denigrated by modernist critics and militantly challenged by feminists of the 1970s. Today, many female painters, sculptors, photographers, and installation artists have reclaimed this subject matter as the very rich territory that Nellie Mae Rowe always understood it to be and had made it her own. And just as a side note here, if you haven't already done so, please visit the folk art galleries on the fourth floor of the Stent Wing of the High and see Dr. Cohen's installation in the Nellie Mae Rowe Room, which, was, which she put together to coordinate with her talk tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joyce Cohen. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Before I start, I'd like to thank Susan Crawley for inviting me here. Um, we've been talking about this for some time, and it took a little work to schedule it. You have such an active museum and education program. It's really fantastic, and so it's wonderful to finally be here. I'd also like to, to thank Susan's staff who um, worked to send me JPEGs and make, make arrangements for my stay here, and I think also to plan that uh, rainstorm yesterday when I arrived, just so I'd feel at home. I heard that uh, you've had quite, a, quite an active weather um, winter. I'd also like to thank um, Jay Wyland, who I hope is in the audience. Is he here somewhere? Who kindly um, gave me permission to use some of his photographs in this talk. And also Judith Alexander Augustine, who also um, uh, contributed some photos that you'll see tonight. I'd also like to thank Xenia Zed for her many emails back and forth. Um, it's a little daunting, I have to say, to come to Atlanta and talk to an audience who probably knows more about Nellie Mae Rowe than I do, and people who actually knew her. Um, this is a talk that grows out of a long interest in self-taught artists, but also is colored by my experience teaching at a women's college about women artists. This will be a rather personal talk, a consideration of Nellie Mae Rowe's work in relationship to the theme of house and home, a theme that runs through American art from the quilts and samplers of the 18th and 19th centuries to the present day. You've probably all heard the phrase, anonymous was a woman, which was coined by uh, Virginia Woolf. And I just wanted to repeat those words before I started as a reminder and backdrop for this look at Nellie Mae Rowe's work. Although many of you here tonight know well the story of Nellie Mae Rowe, I'd like to review a bit of it first. Many have commented on the irony of her birth the fact that she was born on the 4th of July, 1900, Independence Day, the and the first, day, the first year of the 20th century. She was the ninth child of a sharecropper family descended from slaves. The littlest sister, she often escaped from the hard work of the fields and bundled the family laundry into dolls. She tied the heads and drew faces on them. Whenever possible, at the end of the day, 
She loved to lie on the ground, I mean on the floor, and draw. As an adult, Nellie Mae Rowe frequently spoke of, about the fact that her parents both made things with their hands. Her father was a blacksmith and basket maker. Her mother sewed dresses for her daughters, made quilts, and taught these crafts to her children. They were also a family of storytellers. Although Nellie Mae Rowe attended school for four years, from her earliest days, her lifelong education would be in her own hands, both figuratively and literally. Like many young women of her social class, she married young at age 16 to escape a life of hard uh, field work. She hoped for something more. As a wife, she did housework at home and also worked as a domestic. I, I believe there was some field work in there as well in those first years. When her first husband died, she remarried. But then at 48, she was widowed again and on her own. At this point, she lived in the small house that she, oops, that she and her husband had built. That she and her second husband had, had built in Vinings. She had no children, a fact that she regretted all her life, although she did have close relationships with many of the children of her siblings. At 48, she famously declared, I ain't fooling around no more. No more cooking, no more marrying. I'm going to get back to play in my playhouse. I decided I kept house long enough. I don't want to be bothered by no, no one, except myself. In recent years, a growing literature has documented how women in different countries and historical periods found inventive ways to negotiate the limitations of their times and to forge identities as artists. Their stories from the, from the medieval cloisters of the 12th century to the 20th century share notable features. Their creativity extends to both their art and to their social circumstances. Against remarkable odds, women have managed to become artists when they had few role models, when they were denied education, and when they had little support from their societies. Nellie Mae Rowe explained that she had always wanted to be an artist, but didn't have the chance. Later in life, she reflected that now young people today have choices that she never had. Although Rowe continued to work for another 30 years after her husband's death before she was able to retire, she used her spare time for creative activity. The house that you see here became both an actual home and a metaphor. She, she embellished interior and exterior spaces and also made dolls and drawings. Over the 43 years she lived here, the house was her studio, a central image in her art, and an idiosyncratic display. Nellie Mae Rowe's embrace of play has been characterized in many reports of her life, but often without the context that explains the power of her independence, as well as the deep memory that she had of her little girl self, the child who began to discover a special identity through drawing and making dolls. Play was an important psychic touchstone that directed Nellie Mae Rowe for her entire life. She, re she rejected the roles, roles available to someone of her race and social class, and the dichotomy between work and play was especially poignant for an African-American woman in Rowe's historic moment. A relatively new book called Labor of Love, Labor of Sorrow, Black Women, Work, and the Family written by feminist historian Jacqueline Jones, has offered a compelling analysis of how working class black women in the mid 20th century, despite the changes brought about, brought about by post-war industrialization, were virtually excluded from improvements in work life. Their possibilities remained domestic service and child care in other people's homes, um, or the lowest level jobs in factories and fields. Play for Nellie Mae Rowe was a felt way toward, a, toward 
a felt way forward for a resourceful and religious woman. Later in life, she spoke about the gift God had given her and the need to fulfill his mission for her through her art. Doll making and drawing were ongoing as early as 1950, whenever she had time, but it appears that the yard was an early improvisatory enterprise. The garden was always there and constantly evolving, deeply engaging and a distraction from loneliness. I kept busy, she said in later life. I first started hanging things in trees and bushes in my yard. I put a wig on a head and, some, and something, sometimes have a shawl hanging from it. It looked like a person sitting up in the tree. I'd color with lipstick and crayon. The color would fade, but I like it when things keep changing because it keeps me busy. People would bring her things and she would transform and that she would transform and inco incorporate into the yard in an inventive form of relational aesthetics. She seemed to collect people in the same way that she collected stuff, as she called it. She recycled everything and scavenged for interesting material. Imagine what it might have been like to give this, this lady cast-offs of things that she might find useful in her creative effort, and then to witness their incorporation into her installations. In fact, there are some people here tonight who did have that experience, who knew Nellie May Rowe, and did give her things, and also were given things by her. In 1971, a young Judith Alexander Augustine created a unique record of Nellie May Rowe's yard and playhouse when she was a student doing a photography project at Boston University. Judith explained that her mother passed Nellie May Rowe's house every day and was the one who suggested that they just knock on the door. Later, her aunt, Judith Alexander, would come to represent Nellie May Rowe in her Atlanta gallery. I think it's clear enough so um, you can read the text. This is a short tour of Nellie May Rose gar uh, yard using Judith Augustine's photographs. I just learned tonight that uh, I didn't use one of her favorites. I'm sorry, I'll have to come back and do another talk. What's obvious from these pictures is the dynamism and visual excitement of Nellie Mae Rose Yard in 1971. Growing things, making something out of nothing, recycling and transforming the meaning of fragments of life were the animating force of this environment. Like many dressed yards of visionary artists throughout the South, Rowe attended to the boundaries of her property, decorating fences, thresholds and doorways, and situating guardian, guardian fig, figures at entry points. These are all hallmarks explained by Gray Gundacker and Judith McWillie in the two, uh, 2005 book called no, Hidden, no Space Hidden, about yards and environments. This is a wonderful book, by the way, um, if any of you are interested to um, track it down. Other scholars have described how cultural and religious values were often expressed in these environments and how found and transformed objects assume a special spiritual power in many aspects of African American culture. Nellie Mae Rowe's interventions were often fragile and therefore temporary, causing her to make constant additions and adjustments. 